started this already. <laughs> Okay, so number 12 says, we want to find the distance from a point P to the line through these two points. So this is a geometry course. This is a calculus of geometry in, in uh, three dimensions. So many, 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 like a vast majority of the problems that you come across are going to require imagery, picture, draw a picture. Okay, so you don't have to actually, for this one, you don't have to draw these points exactly in the right place in R3, but just make a picture Say so here's point P, and then say you know, Q is here, maybe R is here. And it wants the distance from P to the line that's through Q and R. So there's some line that goes through Q and R, and, and then we want what? So the, the distance is going to be like perpendicular distance closest the closest route to get from P to the line will be distance and so we want that right there and so thinking about the tools that we have you know we've never done a problem like this it's not telling you what to use so thinking about the tools that we have so notice that you know D is perpendicular to this line QR so it looks like you know, like we're creating what? A new frame of reference. That's not going to be the same as, you know, I, J, and K frame of reference. It's going to be, it's going to be slanted in space, right? This is this whole thing is going to be slanted in space. And the fact that, that this distance is perpendicular QR, this is kind of like, oh, we need, we're working in a different frame of reference here. And we have a tool for that. So do you remember from last time? We have a tool for a new frame of reference. And that was vector projection, vector projection. So thinking about QR, you know, if I took if I have the vector QR, I'll just draw it smaller here. Uh, Francis, your your microphone is on. Francis? There's some noise coming from your around your computer. Oh, I'm so sorry, Professor. That's okay. That's, one. that's okay. All right, so uh, QR would be this vector here. And so what do we want? It's like we want a vector, like a, comp a vector component that's orthogonal to QR, right? And we talked, last time we talked about the parallel and uh, orthogonal components of one vector in a new frame of reference. So what would be that vector that we're, so really, if we, do this vector QP like this. Then QP's components are, here's the parallel comp component of QP to QR, and here's the perpendicular component of QP to QR. And these two, so I'll just call these like A and B. So what would the relationship of QP, A, and B B mathematically. So if A and B are the components that make up QP, then how can I write, an, write a relationship for those? A plus B equals QP. Yeah, right. Right. That's exactly what, Components are like you pulling apart a vector into components. So when you add the components together, you get the vector, right? And so they're, and they're tip to tail right here, right? So A plus B is the same as QP. Okay, what are we after? If we if we knew what vector b was, we'd be home free because the, the magnitude of b would be the distance. So what would be? B b would be qp minus a. Right? So that's so this was like the next step of what we talked about last time. We talked about getting the parallel component. So the, the perpendicular component is just a matter of the fact that when you have one of the components and the vector, you can just subtract and you can get the other component. All right, so we know points Q and P. We know we know what we can find the vector QP. So then all we need is vector A. Well, what is that? That's the component of QP parallel to QR. And we have the tool for that. 
What is that? So that would be, and that's what we learned last time. We learned that the parallel component of some vector in a new frame of reference is called the vector projection. So the projection of QP onto QR. And we derived the formula for that last time. So this idea of using vector projection, you kind of like have to be on the lookout for it. It has to be a tool that you just have on the ready. It's not going to, you know, some, some questions will say find the vector projection and so on. But these application problems, you kind of have to recognize when it, when it makes sense. And, and when it makes sense to use is when it's like you're dealing with some transformed new frame of reference, right? So like, like this one. So it's the fact that we wanted the distance from P which is a perpendicular distance to QR, well, that's forming a new frame of reference. So this is a perfect chance to use vector projection. <coughs> so that's our roadmap for that one. Um, there's other ways to do this. You could also just use scalar projection and think of this as a right triangle. Maybe that's a little even easier. Scalar projection gives you that distance there. So, and you need this distance here, so that's a, that's a kind of a hint to do it a different way. But uh, in either case, you're using this idea of changing the frame of reference. Okay, and that's similar to the next problem. Any questions on that? And then the next problem, similar, is the Gandalf, Gandalf problem. Where Victor, Professor, are you recording? I am recording, just not through yeah. Zoom. I'm using yeah, but thank you, thank you. Um, so in the Ganoff problem, uh, he starts walking at this the v vector three comma one three i plus one j, and then turns a right angle, and then keeps walking, and then uh, you have to figure some things out about that. Well, lo and behold, look. That's a, trans that's a transformation into a new frame of reference, right? So the fact that he's walking here, he turns a right angle. So there's points involved here, vectors. But really this is, again, this is a problem that in involves a transformation into a new, a new frame of reference. And then maybe that frame of reference you want is this V vector, the first leg of the walk along three comma one. That's my numbers, you'll have different numbers. Okay, so again, here's a, when you get into this question, the realization, oh, look, it's a new frame of reference. Walking this way, turning a right angle means I have a new set of axes kind of that's rotated from X and Y, vector projection. It's gonna be a good to, a, a, a tool, right? What is vector projection? It's the component of some vector parallel to another, and that other vector is defining a new frame of reference. Okay, so those are some hints on those questions. Again, use the email instructor button for support this weekend, and then look for that, the next one, 04, uh, which will be cross product. Look for that uh, web work as well. Okay, so let's, uh, you worked on a little bit of some just got got kind of your feet wet a little bit in cross product so let's do this slide and it says talked about that and with vectors now we've encountered three kinds of multiplication the first is scalar multiplication so the scalar multiplication it multiplies a what by a what and results in a what does anyone know that Scalar by a vector and results in a vector. I agree. And so the meaning then is, what is this new vector compared to the original one? So how, how does this new vector compare to the original one? You start recording. Yeah, go ahead, Francis. No, I'm asking if we started recording, that's fine. Yeah, it's, I'm recording. I'm just not oh. using Zoom. Oh, thank you so much. What it would be is it would be the same vector just made bigger. For example, if you multiply a vector by two in your vector components, you know, it's i, j, and k would be, say, one, two, three. Multiply by two would be two, four, six, for example. 
Right, so it's so that's a scaled version of the original vector. So maybe it's magnified or maybe it's shrunk. And then is it going to be in the same direction as the vector? Yes, if it's multiplied by or level. If it's negative, then the opposite. So we can always say parallel. So scaled version of the original, parallel to the original. If the because if the scalar is positive, it's truly in the same direction. If the scalar is negative, it flips the direction the other way. So in both cases. For sure, it's parallel. All right, dot product multiplies somebody new. A what by a what and results in a what? Okay. And so, who remembers from last time this really important meaning for a dot product? Hint, it's a product. Product of what? It's the product of the X components plus the Y component. Wait, no. The product of, well, you add the X component Magnet. product with the component of the Y. So that's that's true, but that's that's just the formula to get the answer. That's not the meaning. So what was the meaning that we came up with? So there's the product of... Magnitudes. Magnitudes, right? So, so first and foremost, the dot product is the product of the magnitudes, but then there's a condition, right? But? To the extent that they're in the same direction. Exactly. But only as much as those vectors are in the same direction. If they are in the same direction, then you get the product of the magnitudes. If they have nothing in common in terms of direction, what, what is that? Orthogonal. Orthogonal. So orthogonal vectors have nothing in common in terms of direction. There's no part of one that's in the direction of the other, so you get a dot product of zero. And that's a really important important fact. Whenever vectors are orthogonal, the dot product is zero. So but only so it's the product of the magnitudes only as much as their same direction. Okay, finally. Cross product multiplies, and somebody new multiplies a what by a what and results in a what? A vector by a vector and results in a vector. Right. So this type of multiplication, you're multiplying two vectors together, and you get a vector. And so of both vectors. Okay, good. So it, you, one of the things you might have discovered is that the direction is orthogonal to both original vectors. Okay, and then what about, so then what about the magnitude, because it's a vector now, so the magnitude is? Uh, could you say that it's a product of the magnitudes, uh, like a dot product, except only as much as they are in the orthogonal directions? Oh, you just made my day. You just made my day. That was awesome. Right. Is it both so it's, an, it's another, the magnitude of the cross product is another product of the magnitudes. Okay, but it has a different condition. But now, it's not as much as they're in the same direction, but I don't, I'm running out of room, so you'll have to, I'm not going to write anymore. You'll have to write this. But as much as what he said, they're in, orth, they're orthogonal to one another, right? So it's, it's another product of the, ma the, the magnitude of the cross product is like the dot product and in that it's a product of the magnitudes, but it's kind of the inverse situation. Now, it's as much as they're orthogonal. So when they're orthogonal, you get the actual product of the magnitudes, and when they're parallel, you get zero. Okay, so let's let's talk more about this. So, and if, if you figured out some or all of that, doing today's little written homework, that's great. So I just wanted to get you thinking about it, see what you'd come up with. So let's take a look at that sheet. Look at the seven at the top here. Okay, you can see the worksheet right now? Yes. All right, so this first one, three zero zero cross zero zero, or three, negative three zero zero. This is called the zero vector. 
it has no direction and no magnitude. So it's kind of like a point anywhere. It's like a point vector, and that could be anywhere. All right, and what do we get? So look, they're parallel. When they're parallel, you get no, there's no magnitude to your uh, vectors or to your cross product. All right, similarly back here, negative three, zero, zero, negative three, zero, zero. Also parallel, magnitude zero. So what I was then, what we're doing here is I, I've always got negative three, zero, zero. And then that first vector then like comes around like the unit circle, first and second quadrant, like this. So the first the first one here we got is uh, what, two, one, zero, something like that. And what do we notice? We get zero, zero, three. And then one, two, zero, and now we get zero, zero, six. So look, as they're becoming what, more orthogonal, the magnitude of the cross product is growing until we get orthogonal. And then what's the magnitude of the cross product? So we got three and three. So magnitude three crossed with a magnitude of three and those vectors are orthogonal means the dot pro or the cross product. It's magnitude nine is the product of the magnitudes, three times three. And then as they, as they move more and more parallel, that thing start, the magnitude of that cross product goes back down again. So here's six, and then three, and then finally zero. So as that vector, it starts, they, it starts parallel, the cross product is zero. As it comes around, as it moves towards or, being orthogonal, that cross product increases until we get to the vectors are orthogonal and then it's maximized at the product of the magnitudes. And then it keeps going, and it, it's getting closer and closer to parallel, so that vector is getting less and less orthogonal. The, uh, the, these two vectors are less and less orthogonal, more and more parallel, so the magnitude of the cross product comes back down to zero again. Okay, so, yeah, so, um, so let's just write then how do we how do we mathematize or quanti quantify that magnitude of the of the product of the magnitudes in as much as they are orthogonal? What would that be? Magnitude of u times magnitude of v. What is it? Times sine theta. That's right. Sine theta. Sine theta relates to the opposite side of the triangle. So this is like how much how much a, a, a component orthogonal to the other one, right? So like if we took the sine theta times V, it'd be, it'd be the portion of V that's orthogonal to you. Whereas cosine was the portion of V parallel to you. Okay. Someone, someone was started a question. Does someone have a question? Yeah, I had a question, professor. Sure. Um, so in the, in the worksheet that I submitted, uh, I, I, I interchanged the the x and the y axes, and like, but I label them. So is it fine? Um, yeah, it's okay. Just uh, conventionally, it's gonna it's gonna be a lot less confusing when you're uh, interacting with others if we all have the same axes. And I'm gonna be strictly teaching, you know, x here and y here. So just make that adjustment from here on out. Just make sure you you're using uh, this convention just for ease so that we're all on the same page. Okay? All right, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. All right. Let's see here. So we were talking about um, this magnitude of the cross product then is the product of the magnitudes in as much as they're orthogonal, and that would be sine theta. Okay, and then we said the direction, we said the direction is orthogonal. So notice all these vectors are in the xy plane. So along the z-axis, is going to be orthogonal to, always orthogonal to the xy plane. Okay. Okay, someone has their microphone on. 
70 reais, 80 reais. Galera, estou fazendo esse vídeo aqui para vocês, para falar para vocês que não existe milagre. Is that Rodrigo? Rodrigo, are you there? I believe you're able to mute him if he needs you. Yeah. I'd rather make sure they know. <laughs> um, okay, so... All right, so that's the magnitude. What about the direction? So, so we said the direction of the cross product is orthogonal to both of the original vectors. Okay, and that's seen in all these examples. And uh, so that therefore it's orthogonal to the plane of those two original vectors. But then what happens is that, uh, let's say uh, this one here. There's actually two directions that are orthogonal to say, so here's my u and here's my v. There's actually two directions that are orthogonal to u and v. Do you see that? There's the direction that we got, but then there's also down, negative z, is also orthogonal to u and v. So the cross product's only gonna be one of those, so which one is it? So we have something called the right-hand rule. The right-hand rule tells us which direction the cross product goes. So like for this one, does it go up positive z or does it go down negative z? Well, I told you that went up, but how would you know that otherwise? So uh, the right-hand rule says, put your index finger in the direction on your right hand, your index finger in the direction of u, and then put your third finger, so this u will be index finger, on your right hand, and then v, you're gonna point your third finger in the direction of v, your, so what we call the tall man, okay? And when you do that, when you get your hand oriented, your right hand oriented so that your index finger points this way and your third finger points this way, then your thumb, the natural position of your thumb, will tell you which of these which two of the orthogonal directions it is. Okay, so let me, uh, is my camera on? Can you see me with my hand here? Yes. So here's my right hand, here's my right hand, and I got, uh, I'm gonna point U, so your, your view of it, U is pointing this way, is that correct? So to your, to your right and a little bit back, and then V, so I need to, um, orient V, and so V is gonna be back into the screen and a little bit left, like this. So I got U that way, index finger, and then my third finger, V, this way. And when I do that, I got it set, just like, then my thumb is showing me that, that the cross product is in the positive Z direction, which agrees with what we, what we just said there. So the, the magnitude of the cross product is the product of the magnitude sine theta, or as much as they are orthogonal. And then the direction of the cross product is orthogonal to both the original vectors and that determined by the right-hand rule. So your two, from your two options of orthogonality, the right-hand rule tells you which one it is. So the right-hand rule is like a way of oriented, orienting three dimensions, right? So in our standard axes, I, J, K, I, cross j, so again, i would be this way, j would be to your right, no, so i would be this way, so i would be coming out at you, right, and then j would be to your right, and when you do that, you get k is positive, so i cross j is positive k. And so the right-hand rule is what, like, just orients three directions to one another in a relative way. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Professor, quick question. Sure thing. Orthogonal is just pretty much same perpendicular, correct? That's right, it's a more general okay. term. So perpendicular is, is uh, for geometry. It's like a right angle, right? Perpendicular is a right angle in geometry. But when you right. get into higher dimensions, like four, five, six dimensions, you don't have right angles, you know, it's just, okay. 
You can't imagine that, but you still have the right. principle of orthogonal. Okay. So orthogonal is more the general term. And for our purposes, yes, it will mean perpendicular or right angle. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's go down and look at this, uh, the last one as an example in the, in the worksheet. I'm just wondering. Sure. In that previous example, if you flipped, uh, what was it, U and V? Uh-huh. Would it be pointing down? Yep, then you would get, right. So if you change the order of the cross product vectors, then you get the opposite. Yep, you get, you get the opposite direction. So where was that? Was it this one? So if I did U, if that was my U and this was my V, and now if you put your index finger in, in this direction and your third finger in this direction, if you get your right hand oriented so you, so you can do that, then your thumb will point down. And the cross product would be zero, zero, negative six. Okay, yep, so changing the order into taking the cross product just gives you the opposite vector, opposite direction. All right. So this example here is 0, negative 2, 0, this vector here, and then 4, 0, 1. It'd be this vector here. Okay, so let's try to make some predictions about this, magnitude and direction. So what can I say? What can I say about the relative direction of these two vectors? You notice anything? See that vectors of four zero one? They cross into the second octant. Um, I'm not sure what you mean. And so do you see that 401 is in the x, I've drawn the xz plane here. Do you see that it's in the xz plane? And then 0, negative 2, 0 is along the y-axis. So what can you say about those two vectors? They form a right triangle. Yeah, a right angle, that's right. Yep. Yeah, okay. They're orthogonal to one another. Does everyone see that? So any vector in the xz plane is going to be orthogonal to the y-axis. Right, so these are orthogonal. So this is tipped up a little bit, but it's still making a right angle there. And how can we, how can we con, uh, con, uh, confirm that? How can we confirm that these are at a right angle? With what? What tool do we have? Vector dot product. Dot product, right? Dot product. So we're talking about the cross product. We can use the dot product to confirm that they are orthogonal. Zero plus zero plus zero. Check. Okay, so because they're orthogonal, what can we say about the magnitude of this cross product? It's gonna be a product of the magnitude. Right, exactly. Magnitude of this one is two. Magnitude of this one is radical 17. Therefore, the, the, the magnitude of u cross v is gonna be two radical 17. Okay, what about the direction? So now, the direction is determined by the right-hand rule. It's going to be orthogonal to both of these. But then there's two possibilities. There's like this one that's kind of like up, mostly up and a little bit back, right? There's that direction. And then there's the direction that's mostly down and a little bit forward. You can see that? So these are kind of the two possibilities. And so then the right-hand rule will, will confirm which one it is. So you're going to point your, point your index finger of your right hand in the direction of negative y, which is like this. And then your third finger in the direction of 401. That's so it's coming out at you. And which way does my thumb point? Up and a little bit back. If you're looking at my hand, I'm showing you that, that situation. So, we by the right-hand rule, it's going to be this direction. That's going to be our cross product. It's going to be up and a little bit back with a magnitude of 2 radical 17. So I want to show you 
So, so this, this is a really important conversation. So we get the feel of what cross product is like, but we still haven't said, how do we get the components actual vector for the cross product? That's what I'm going to show you next. Okay. So, so what is, how do you get a cross product? How do you get the components? All right. So let's do that next. And so I'm going to show you how to do that. And then we're going to compare our result to these conclusions we've made that the, the magnitude is two radical 17. And the direction is this kind of mostly up and a little bit back direction. Okay, so let me show you how to calculate the components of a cross product. So what you do is you set up a three by three matrix. And then you, the first row is i, j, and k. The second row is your first vector in the cross product. And your third row is the second vector in the cross product. And we're gonna, that, we're gonna make a matrix out of that and we're gonna, we're gonna do the determinant of that matrix. So if you've done determinants before, there's different methods to do the determinant. Any method will get you the right cross product. I will show you my preferred way, but if you have a different way, to do the determinant, you're welcome to do that as long as you're doing it right. So the way that I like to do this is, I like to repeat the first two columns. So write the first two columns again, I zero four and J negative two zero. And then we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at some diagonals here. There's actually three diagonals that go down to the right. and three diagonals that go down to the left once you've done that. And what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to multiply along every diagonal. So there's six diagonals. You're going to multiply the numbers along every diagonal and then you're going to get those products and then you're going to add the ones that are down to the right and subtract the ones that are down to the left. Okay. So let's do so let's do our down to the right products first. So it's going to be this one's going to be negative 2i along that diagonal and then 0j and then 0k. And those are added. So I've got I'm adding those together. Okay? And then down to the left, boom boom boom. We're going to subtract those. So minus what k times negative 2 times 4 negative 8k and then subtract 0i minus 0i and then subtract 0j and now we're just going to find the one vector I'll write it in component form now and so what is it we got negative 2i and 0i that's negative 2 0j and 0j makes 0 zero K and minus negative AK is plus eight. So there's my cross product, negative two, zero, eight. So I've actually got it in component form now. So questions on this like algorithm or this method to get the cross product as a vector. Okay, very good. So let's compare what we, what do we find? We said the magnitude should be Let's do the magnitude of our vector, which is what? Square root of two squared plus zero squared plus eight squared, which is the square root of 68. And is that two radical 17? Indeed. So that's right. So, I, so, so we, we kind of figured out the, the magnitude two different ways. First, we recognize that they're orthogonal, so we said, oh, we can just multiply the, multiply the magnitudes of the two original vectors, and that should give us the cross product magnitude. Then I also got the actual vector, and then used the magnitude formula. Same thing, both ways. Okay, what about direction? Negative 2, 0, 8. Is that this mostly up, a little bit back direction? Mostly up. A little bit back. Direction checks out.
Okay, lots of quiet in the in the universe here. Am I, can you still hear me? Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Very good. People just need to be yeah, me Mes by me just mesmerized. Mes uh, I do not know what a determinant is. I've never done anything with determinants or matrices for that matter, but uh, you know, it's fine. Yeah, to yeah. Do yeah, that's fine. I showed you how to do it. Yeah, this way is more easier. Okay, good. Yeah, it's a little bit. Linear algebra. Yeah, and yeah, so and I, I showed you everything you need to know. So you don't, you, you don't even not have to know that this is the determinant of a matrix. Mm. Just write out the vectors, i, j, k, first vector, second vector, rewrite the first two columns, and then do this thing I told you. So multiply down all six diagonals, add the results that go down to the right, subtract the results that go down to the left. So you, you, you don't even have to know that it has anything to do with linear algebra. You just follow the, follow the rules. What's the definition of a determinant? Oh, that's a good question. I haven't. It's been a while, so uh, it's yeah. It's it's some. It's like kind of like the when you you have a matrix. So if these were all values, then you'd get a number. You would get a particular number, and it's something of the the size or the magnitude of this grid of numbers. So I, I can't do much better than that right off the top of my head. That it cannot be a zero. Okay, so what do we got here? Okay, so let's look at, I want to talk about some applications of dot product and cross product, or the idea of applying dot product and cross product, if there's no more questions on this. Do we have a quiz at the end of the class? Always. Okay. Well, maybe not always, but always count on it. Yeah, always count on it. Sounds good. Yep. And I do my very best to get that going in the last five minutes. Sometimes I'm a couple minutes over, but... I think we'll be okay today. All right, here we go. So let's talk about this. So applying. So uh, dot product versus cross product and applications. Dot product. So based on our meaning of it. So this is going to be for quantities that uh, what are optimized and maximized when the original vectors, the contributing vectors are in the same direction, right? Because we know that's when you get the product of the magnitudes when they're parallel. And then when those vectors are zero, or when those vectors are orthogonal, we would expect you know, a value of zero in whatever this application is, okay? So that's how we kind of look for, look, what we look for for dot product. And then for cross product, it's kind of the inverse situation. So if you have two quantities and they're optimized when the contributing vectors are orthogonal, but then it's zero when they're parallel, that's going to be a, a use of the cross product. Okay, so this goes figuring out which of the two of these dot product cross product to use in a particular application, we we should we shouldn't have much of a problem with that because we know what each of them what they do, right? What each of them do. So let's take a look at So uh, area. So when you have two vectors, tail to tail, you get a distinct parallelogram. And so I'm showing you a range of parallelograms here, um, if you can imagine that with your mind's eye. So the, do you see that, oops. One wrong button. All right, let's try this. Okay. So I'm showing you different. So if I were to pause this, can you see that there's a unique parallelogram, not unique, distinct, a distinct parallelogram based on these two vectors? Technology, competing technologies. So do you see that there's a distinct parallelogram the only parallelogram I could draw here that has those two as sides would be like this one. Something like that. Okay, so what, now, what about the area of such a parallelogram? Does that match up with our 
meaning for cross product or dot product? Right, because what dot product max is maximized when the vectors are parallel, and is uh, minimized when they're orthogonal. Does that agree with area? Yes. No. no. Some are saying yes. Some are saying no. When do we get the maximum area? It's with the orthogonal. Orthogonal, right? Right here. Or a little bit more. Here's, here's maximum area when it's a rectangle. When they're parallel, when the vectors are parallel, how much area do you get? Zero. Zero. Okay, so is that dot product or cross product? Dot. It's a cross product. Cross product. Because a plug in us. Cross product. Right? Cross product. Cross product, right? Dot product is zero when they're orthogonal. We don't want that, right? We get a lot, we get the biggest area when they're orthogonal. Dot product gives a zero when the vectors are orthogonal. Cross product gives maximum value when they're orthogonal. We want cross product. And let's see how that plays out. Okay, so let's let's do the math and see how this is relates to cross product. All right, so we got we want the area of this parallelogram. So the area of a parallelogram, so if I call this vector B and this vector A, and the area of a parallelogram, if you remember from your geometry, is? Length times width. Yeah, or base times, right, base times height. So base times height. So we'll call this H for height. So I could take the magnitude of B, that would be my base, times this height. And that will give me this area, this yellow area. Okay, but what is H? I'm going to rewrite H in terms of A. How could I rewrite H in terms of A? The magnitude of A. H would be sine theta. Yeah, it would be the magnitude of A sine theta. Does anybody recognize what that is? Cross it's not the cross product. It's the magnitude of the cross product. Magnitude of the cross product. This is just a number, right? So this is the magnitude of the cross product. So, and this is going to be a really important application when we get to the end of the course, vector calculus, surface integrals, that the 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 uh, the parallelogram formed by two vectors tail to tail, its area. Its area is the magnitude of the cross product. So what does this show us? It shows us that we could get this area without having this angle. We don't have to do this. We don't need the angle. Why? Because we could take the cross product, right? We could take the cross product, get a vector, and do what? Find, find its magnitude. If you find its magnitude, you never had to find the angle, right? Mm -hmm. So the magnitude of the cross product ends up being the area of the distinct parallelogram formed by the two vectors when they're tail to tail. And that's pretty cool. I mean, it just came it came right out, right? That's exactly what the magnitude of the cross product is when we, we used our base times height. Okay, take the quiz. Get the support you need on the homework. I'll stick around for a few minutes after class here. Go take the quiz. Uh, remember, you have two web works due Monday night, so get started on those as soon as you can. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you on Monday.